Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, more folks are, are trickling in, but we'll go ahead and get started with our introduction. I'm Dr. Liz watts Malujos, and I'm a research archaeologist and the collaborative research liaison at the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. I'll be the moderator for today's lecture. On behalf of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey and my co-organizer who just popped on the screen, Dr. Aaron Benson, again, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are excited to wrap up our second annual speaker series, The Intersections of Indigenous Knowledge and Archaeology, with a lecture today by Dr. John Lowe. The series is being supported by funds from the Office of the State Archaeologist and the Student Cultural Programming Fee. Uh, before we get started, just a little housekeeping. Participants will remain muted with video off for the duration of the lecture, but you can submit questions to me directly at any time using the chat function, and we will have a question and answer discussion uh, following the lecture as time allows. As I said before, my name is Liz and I work out of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey's American Bottom Field Station in Collinsville, Illinois. The survey, also referred to as ISAS, is a division of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. We have about 70 full-time archaeologists and support staff working throughout the state, so ISAS is one of the largest archaeological research institutions in the U.S. ISAS is dedicated to the preservation and interpretation of the archaeological and architectural remains in what is now the state of Illinois. On behalf of the state archaeologist and director of ISAS, Dr. Timothy Pocketat, today we are honored to host Dr. Lowe. Before I continue, I would like to recognize that the university and ISAS are located on the ancestral homelands of several tribes. We recognize and acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Chickasaw, and other nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal, and these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations. This acknowledgement and the centering of native peoples is a start as we move forward for the next 150 years. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Dr. John Lowe. Uh, he is an associate professor and director of the Newark Earthworks Center at The Ohio State University. And is, as, and is an enrolled citizen of the Bokagan Band of Potawatomi Indians. Dr. Lowe received his PhD in American culture at the University of Michigan, along with a Juris Doctorate and a Graduate Certificate in Museum Studies. As an Associate Professor, Dr. Lowe teaches in Comparative Studies and also in History, American Indian Studies, and Religious Studies. As director of the Newark Earthworks Center, he oversees interdisciplinary projects and research about American Indian cultures that produce monumental earthworks across the Ohio River Valley in order to advance understanding of the cultural and scientific achievements of American Indians to the world. Dr. Lowe's research interests and expertise include American Indian histories and identities, material culture and representation, American Indian law, sovereignty, and treaty rights, among other things. Recently, Dr. Lowe served as co-curator and basket caretaker for the exhibit po Pokagon Potawatomi Black Ash Baskets, our storytellers, currently on exhibit at the Field Museum in Chicago. Please um, help me silently because we're virtual and you can't do anything. Please help me welcome Dr. John Lowe. And I will stop sharing my screen and allow Dr. Lowe to share his. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, very honored uh, to be here. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Liz. Uh, appreciate the uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, uh, you know, it has some educational value to articulate uh, the Native peoples who were here uh, before uh, colonization and settlement. And I'm really honored that you all came. Uh, very honored that uh, you're all in the audience today. Um, I should uh, introduce myself uh, in a uh, Potawatomi traditional way. Uh, Buju Jayak, hello everyone. Uh, John Lao Deshnikov, my name is John. Um, 
Pokegnek Bodwadmi and Nishnabi Nimi, um, Pokegnek Ben Parwadmi, I'm a human being, um, uh, Miske Dodem, I'm Turtle Clan. I uh, uh, was born and raised in the community of the Pokegan Band of Potawatomi, but find myself now in central Ohio, working for the uh, the Ohio State University and have the uh, uh, privilege of being the director of the Newark Earthwork Center. So I'm going to share my screen. So the uh, title of uh, today's talk is Indigenuity, the Power of Black Ash Baskets of the Potawatomi. Uh, uh, some uh, um, asterisks uh, after indigenuity. I thought it was very clever. Uh, ingenuity, indigenous. Um, I've gotten mixed reactions uh, from my uh, friends and colleagues about that but I'm sticking with it for today. So um, I like wordplay. So uh, black ash baskets uh, are a lot more than just baskets. And so let me tell you why. So here's the great circle at the Newark Earthworks, Hopewell era uh, people. We don't know how they were socially or politically uh, organized, uh, but we know that a lot of people built uh, thousands of uh, earthworks and mounds uh, across Ohio, uh, particularly. Uh, these sites are uh, currently nominated for uh, UNESCO World Heritage status, which we're really excited about. But I also bring forth this, uh, this picture uh, as a reminder that I wanted to tell you that uh, students ask me oftentimes, well, how were they built? Well, they were uh, built with earth, most sacred material uh, to uh, certainly contemporary Indian people. And being an ethno historian, I've worked backwards uh, with reasonable speculations and suspect it was the most sacred material to Hopewell era peoples too. Milk Muskegon on Grandmother Earth. How were how was the earth carried? Uh, in baskets, probably. What were the baskets made of? They may have been made of uh, cane and or black ash. And I'm going to be talking about black ash baskets uh, today, this afternoon, with your permission. So. This gives you an idea of uh, Potawatomi territory. Uh, certainly after the Beaver Wars, we returned to our homelands, driven out of the area by the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, returned back to our homelands, and uh, which included uh, a large part of uh, the Great Lakes region. So, uh, Black ash baskets. I grew up with black ash baskets. My grandmother was a basket maker. Uh, at events, uh, as I was growing up, uh, I would see black ash baskets. Uh, black ash baskets were made by uh, tribal members for the University of Notre Dame, which sits on our homelands. Uh, they use them for laundry hampers, interestingly enough. So they got pretty rough use, so they had to be replaced every year. And so when the uh, the priest would bring the uh, baskets back to the tribe uh, to get new ones, they would fill the baskets up with uh, oranges and apples and pears and other sorts of things. So it was a basket exchange, which continues to this day. We don't give them black ash baskets because now they've moved into art 
rather than functional uh, utility items. But uh, they still uh, bring us baskets. So that's one promise, one tradition that uh, they've maintained. They also promised us free education uh, for tribal youth of the Potawatomi, uh, and, but they don't remember that. And it's a long story uh, to talk about that. So, but you can see the obvious pride that this is from a postcard that was common around the country to. Uh, have images of whatever might be interesting, uh, uh, you know, put on a postcard and postcards were popular. People sent them, saved them. But the uh, elders here obviously were putting the baskets right out up front. A lot of pride. So, um, as Liz mentioned, uh, there is an exhibit uh, at the Field Museum that I co-curated uh, of uh, Potawatomi Black Ash Baskets. And the smaller one of these is in that exhibit, uh, but gives you an idea of how large these baskets uh, can get. You know, they're three feet tall or taller. Uh, and they are wonderful for carrying things, uh, but I don't use them too much for carrying things uh, nowadays. But that exhibit will be up until uh, August of this year. So if you're in the Chicago area and uh, you're near the Field Museum, I would encourage you to stop on by. They also have uh, opening very soon uh, their renovations of the uh, North American uh, Indian uh, galleries uh, also. So it would be a fun time. I won't get to see it till this summer but uh, I'm looking forward to it too. So these were uh, two of our prime uh, air ones uh, in the story of black ash basket making. Black ash baskets had moved from an item of uh, utility, as I already mentioned, to an item of craft and uh, as a, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in the uh, after beginning of the 20th century, they had become a tourist item. Michigan is, uh, Pure Michigan is known as the uh, tourist area. Uh, we, the Potawatomi, are in the Sisters Lakes area. A lot of lakes in the area. A lot of people coming from Chicago and elsewhere to come visit, spend the summer, travel, enjoy the weather. And uh, people would uh, set up a roadside stands and sell their baskets. And that's one way that uh, people fed their families. And uh, so I think of that whenever I see a basket, that uh, this basket uh, may have uh, been sold. You know, it might be marked that it's, you know, five cents or 20 cents. or But, you know, it was, the price was right. You know, the black ash was, Free. It just took the creativity and the ingenuity uh, of the maker to make the basket. And then to sell the basket uh, showed uh, the power and value of women in the Pokagon Potawatomi community that many times they were the ones that were the breadwinners too, even during this time. So, but with suppression, oppression, uh, uh, impoverishment, um, changes in economy uh, that happened in the 20th century. The basket making uh, tradition in the uh, Pokagon Potawatomi, which had really been an iconic item for the tribe, my tribe, uh, went into twilight. People weren't passing the tradition on. Uh, people weren't buying baskets anymore. Uh, and uh, people, a lot of these people were actu actually attendees or the descendants of attendees of boarding schools, Indian boarding schools, where they had been taught that uh, being Indian was something to be ashamed of. And uh, that uh, uh, tradition was the enemy of progress. And uh, so 
the tradition was uh, within a cat's whisker, like our language, like our ceremonies, is within a cat's whisker of uh, um, going away. But these ladies, uh, Julia and Agnes, along with others in the 1970s, formed a basket co-op with the intention of making baskets again that would uh, revive the tradition, revive the artistry, revive the beauty, give them a uh, economic and social space for them to be in, uh, to be leaders then. And it really became a focal point for the community as these ladies spread their knowledge to younger people about making baskets. Uh, the community, I saw it with my own eyes living there during this time, that um, it became an item of pride, something that uh, distinguished us. Um, you know, we had a lot of intermarriage, obviously, but, you know, I'm a I'm pretty fair-skinned uh, person. My grandma married a white guy, my mom married a white guy, and so here I am. You know, I can't complain about who my ancestors fell in love with. But uh, so we, it was important that uh, we have tangible material things that we could hold on to and point to and hold and embrace as we are still Potawatomis. We are still Anishinaabe. So these ladies uh, helped uh, do that. And uh, this is a, a nice picture of a... So in Potawatomi, uh, Bodwatomi, we've got Tokpanagan. Potawatomi Black Ash Basket. And so these uh, started seeing these uh, in stores, started seeing these at powwows, at the uh, tribal headquarters. Um, uh, it was, uh, uh, they were being sold. People started to hear about them and travel to come see the basket makers and come buy the baskets. And it was very exciting. It really, I think, helped propel us in our fight we had a 60-year fight when our sovereignty as a tribal nation had been taken away from us in 1934. It wasn't until 1994 that it was restored. In the 70s and 80s, people were beginning to wonder if we would ever be successful in getting our sovereignty reestablished. And this revival of the black ass basket tradition, I think, really contributed to the momentum and the enthusiasm toward, towards that fight. Ray Doherty uh, was also a uh, member of that Black Ash Basket Co-op. And uh, uh, she was like a second mother to me. I miss Ray very much. And uh, so uh, we've uh, always had women uh, as uh, uh influential people in our tribe. Uh, in more recent times, certainly the Black Ash Basket Co-op made these, uh, these women heroes within the community. Uh, Ray was, in fact, a longtime treasurer for our uh, community. As we fought for sovereignty, we were organized as a not-for-profit uh, trying to get our sovereignty. And uh, in fact, we have now a uh, tribal chairperson who is a woman, which I think is really exciting. So this is a strawberry basket. And uh, I actually, uh, well, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, strawberries are very important to Potawatomi people. Uh, strawberry represents uh, the heart. Uh, it's uh, uh, the shape of it is like the heart. Uh, it's considered good food for the heart. Um, and uh, 
So strawberry baskets are a particularly uh, popular uh, form of uh, the way the baskets take and with the green on top and the red, uh, always fun. John Pigeon uh, also uh, uh, became a uh, uh, ambassador for Black Ash Baskets. Uh, O'Kagan tribal member, uh, it's mostly women that do the black ash basket making, but not entirely so. And John and his son, John Jr. also make black, also make baskets. Um, I had an opportunity to harvest a uh, black ash tree with John. Uh, found that uh, going into the swamp empty handed is a lot easier than coming out of a swamp with a 200 pound log, but uh, we got it out, and um, then I uh, he let me uh, try my hand at uh, scraping the bark, and uh, I almost cut my uh, left uh, index finger off, uh, so that was the end of my basket making uh, attempt, um, but uh, so uh, John's been an important uh, uh, supporter and uh, uh, participant in the Black Ass Basket movement also. Uh, a basket made by John. I uh, purchased that from him uh, in a powwow, at a powwow probably about the year 2000 or so. Uh, baskets have gotten uh, rather famous now, our baskets, and we're very proud of this. Uh, Jamie Brown Chapman is an extraordinary uh, basket maker. Uh, this basket, also a uh, rendering of a strawberry basket, a much fancier one that stands about four feet tall, made the cover of the uh, magazine for the National Museum of the American Indian, and uh, she continues to... Uh, uh, make wonderful, beautiful baskets. And uh, so, uh, but others do too within the community. So it's a thriving uh, basket making uh, community uh, today. So, uh, the power of baskets and basket making. Well, baskets are alive with biographies and autobiographies. What do I mean by that? That's what students would always say. What do you mean by that, Professor Lau? Um, well, we believe that uh, baskets have a spirit. I emphasize this in the exhibit at the Field Museum, that uh, baskets aren't uh, static things. They are beings. And they have their own spirit. When they're created, they have a spirit then. And so they can talk. They, If you have ears that can hear, if you listen closely, you might be fortunate enough to go talk to you. Uh, whenever I... Uh, him around my baskets, I I talk to them. Uh, I greet them, I say goodbye to them, I take care of them, keep them warm and cool, uh, not because of museum standards, but because that's how you treat an elder anyway, is you make sure they're comfortable. And the, the baskets will tell you stories about themselves, about where they come from. They also, um, so those are autobiographies, right? They're telling about themselves. They also tell biographies about the makers. Was this a, uh, a good basket maker, a great basket maker? Was it made with care? Was it made with love? And how has it been treated since? Uh, 
what's been its uh, what's been its uh, lived experience, if you will. Uh, many of the baskets that I have that make up the exhibit at the Field Museum, uh, I either purchased from tribal members or gifted to me by tribal members, were family uh, uh, handed down to me through my family. But some of them, on occasion, I bought at uh, flea shops, sort of antique slash flea markets. Um, and uh, a lot of times people have no idea uh, what they have you know, um, on sale there. And so, you know, I don't want to uh, increase the price, so I don't tell them about the basket until I bought it. And uh, but uh, I love to uh, bring them home because I don't think they're happy sitting in shops um, being displayed that way. You know, when they were younger, sure, you know, but you know they deserve better care as an elder. And so I have uh, baskets that are contemporary, relatively old old like me or even older and so um but they tell a lot you can tell from their condition sometimes they'll be uh kind of beaten up but were they used a lot were they not taken care of um you know i handle my baskets uh with my hands because i was taught that the oils from our hands are important to uh, contribute to the baskets to keep them um, uh, from drying out. I remember going to a museum uh, at a, a university and uh, I couldn't touch the baskets in their collection. This isn't a field museum, it's another museum. I couldn't touch the baskets in their collections unless I had white gloves on. Well, the cotton on the white gloves is worse for the baskets than any oils on your hands. So I thought that was bad. Um, and they did not look like, I did not hear happiness coming from those baskets stuck in the storage room. Uh, that's why I was really excited about uh, the um, exhibition at the Field Museum because baskets are storytellers, the second point I wanted to make. They like to be, they're very sociable. They want to be out and about. And I love where the uh, Field Museum positions the uh, exhibit uh, across the way from the Maori, the uh, uh, New Zealand indigenous peoples, the Maori uh, house, the Marae. Um, because that house has a spirit too that the Maori people say, that house is alive. And that house didn't have anyone to talk to that was indigenous, usually. It was just there by itself. But then the baskets came in. And so for the last year and a half, they've been able to have conversations with each other. I would love to know. I wish I was a fly on the wall. I would love to know what those stories were uh, that they were telling but I'm sure that they're happy stories and sad stories and everything in between. The power of baskets is also in the recollection uh, of traditional knowledge. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, you know, part of the historical trauma that Indian people across the country has suffered generally was in part from land taking in part from uh, changes in economy, in part in, from impoverishment, in part from missionization, forced missionization, forced conversion to a foreign uh, religious belief, but also the boarding schools, which I've mentioned. And so boarding schools, uh, my great-grandmother went to a boarding school. Uh, she had passed before I was born. But the sense I've gotten from the few stories that come down through my family is that uh, 
it was not a uh, hot, happy experience. And that she was taught to be ashamed of her uh, traditional religious practices, of her language, and any other activities that marked her as Indian. By making baskets, by this uh, renewal, this basket making movement, we're reclaiming this knowledge, but also reclaiming our identity. And so it promotes an iconic marker of indigeneity, right? Other people have other things around the country that they can be <clears throat> proud of, right? Uh, Iroquois Haudenosaunee beadwork, Ojibwe beadwork, and birch bark uh, basket. Uh, uh, down south, uh, uh, king baskets. Uh, out west, uh, particularly in the southwest, the pottery, the jewelry, um, you know, the carvings, all the things that make them who they are, that celebrates who they are. And for us, black ash baskets celebrate who we are. It also promotes economic development. Um, and uh, recognition of native craft is fine art. Uh, we've moved from the point of, uh, as I mentioned, uh, people aren't using these baskets for laundry hampers anymore. They're recognizing, and the makers of the baskets are making them uh, as pieces of art. They're being uh, uh, collected as pieces of art, being shared as art and uh, uh, displayed as art. And so, uh, but it also uh, was an early uh, economic engine uh, for our community. We didn't have a whole lot else going on until we uh, secured our sovereignty in 1994. For those 60 years, uh, we had a powwow that uh, almost broke even. And uh, that was about it. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but uh, this Black Ash Basket Co-op and the Black Basket Making Movement uh, started bringing in money. And it carried us through until, until we got sovereignty. And then, of course, we opened up uh, our first, first casino, Four Winds Casino. Now we have four of them. And as an aside, I will mention that every day is a lucky day at Four Winds Casino. But that's all I'll plug about that. And it also, lastly, has been a platform for Potawatomi women in particular to express themselves, to advocate for themselves, to uh, uh, express not only who they are as particular individuals, as, as particular artists, but uh, the authority of women within our community. Uh, they had this knowledge. I don't think, frankly, any men in the 1970s knew how to make a black cash basket. It was uh, the women knew how to do this. And thankfully, they, uh, they gathered together, collected it, and shared it with others. And so it survives and thrives to this day. So it's all really very exciting. I'm really happy that I've been able to share with this, uh, this short vignette with you. But sometimes it seems like we always have to drop the other shoe, right? Well, globalization uh, you know, has uh, brought uh, some benefits and also a lot of uh, negatives. We have the emerald ash borer. And uh, I think even down here, perhaps, perhaps you're aware of it now too. Uh, it's been, we've been familiar with it up in Michigan for 20 years. The borers move apparently pretty slow because there's a lot of black ash trees to eat. Um, the larvae, uh, uh, are uh, 
deposited it in the trees. They uh, burrow into the trees during their life cycle as larvae um, and kill the trees. And so almost all the black ash trees have been killed off. It's been similar to um, uh, the, you know, when I was a youngster, uh, the Dutch elm disease, you know, all the beautiful elm trees that uh, died around the country, uh, certainly where I grew up. Uh, I remember my earliest memories of elm trees are, they were either already dead or nearly dead. And that's the way that uh, it's been for uh, black ash trees too. So uh, it's uh, environmental disaster. Uh, it's also a cultural disaster for us. Because if there's no black ash trees, there can be no new black ash baskets. And so what do we do? What do we do when the material that we use to make our art and tell our stories disappears? We are wrestling with that. Uh, the Pokagon Potawatomi have a stand, uh, uh, several acres of black ash trees that they inoculate every year. It's very expensive to inoculate these trees, uh, but the tribe's committed to this. It's not 100% effective, but it seems to be staving the black ash borer off. And so we're maintaining our black ash small forest as best we can. We also have collected as many uh, black ash trees that are undamaged by the larvae. Um, we've collected as many as we can and keep them uh, in places that uh, are um, free of being infested. But uh, mostly what we hope, and it's unclear whether this will happen, is that if the emerald ash borer eats all of the black ash trees and they don't move to another tree, which is a huge if, but if they don't move to another tree, then perhaps their populations will decline and the black ash tree will be able to uh, continue into the future. The alternative is, what are we going to do? Uh, make the baskets out of plastic, uh, make them out of vinyl blinds. Um, people have uh, sarcastically done that, uh, but it's a difficult situation uh, for Native people to find themselves in. And this happens around the world for all of us, right? Uh, you know, the, uh, the benefits and the negatives of uh, the upside and the downside of globalization. So, well, I wanted to leave enough time for uh, plenty of questions. It looks like I talked faster than I anticipated. So that means you have to ask lots of questions. Uh, and so uh, I'm looking forward to that. And I'll stop the screen share. Thank you so much. Um, perfect timing, lots of time for questions, which is great. Uh, I'm going to go to my first question that came in from ISAS director, uh, Dr. Timothy Pocketat. He said, John, wonderful and so important, particularly the link of baskets to Potawatomi sovereignty and that baskets have autobiographies. Oh, and three, that climate uh, climate change and emerald ash borers affect Potawatomi culture. So he has two questions. Yeah. The sure. first being, how are the basket biographies related to the biographies of trees themselves? If they oh, that's are. a great question. Yes, um, because, uh, um, you know, the best, uh, the best uh, black ash is, uh, unlike birch, where the uh, bark can be harvested year after year without killing the tree. Um, you know, we have to, there's a process, you know, when we harvest the tree, black ash tree has to be cut down. So we make prayers, we have songs, our songs, we lay down tobacco, uh, and we honor that tree for its sacrifice. And we 
pick the trees that are straight. Uh, black ash trees tend to grow pretty straight, but some are straighter than others. And the ones that are the straightest are the best ones to use for the basket. So uh, part of it reflects that uh, the if somebody chose that tree to use to make uh, the basket, it's telling me that uh, the tree that it came from, whose spirit it still embodies, uh, was a good, strong tree, right? Uh, a mature tree, a tree that uh, was uh, willing to uh, sacrifice itself because we don't take anything uh, without permission and the creator doesn't provide anything without uh, uh without a sense of obligation and reciprocity on ourselves uh, to respond to that gift. And we realize then that it's a gift. And so there's, it's incumbent then upon the artist not to be wasteful and to be very uh, attentive to their art, to what they're doing. Uh, they're using that material, uh, that material that's been given to them. And, uh, they should be making very good use of it. Of course, there's going to be a wide spectrum of skill um, um, of artists, but hopefully over time, um, you know, skills will develop to the point so that everyone, um, you know, making a basket that you can be proud of, as my grandmother would say. Excellent. Thank you. And we actually had a follow up question about who determines when and who can make um, the baskets or harvest the trees, but you sort of just answered that, that it would be the person making the basket that would go choose the tree. Well, it's um, actually, uh, it's more common. It's a great question. And, and uh, your assumption is more than fair, but it's uh, um, I remember that um, the beginnings of the Black Ash Basket Co-op, I've read about it. I was not there in the room, but I've read um, um, that um, uh, Phil Alexis wrote uh, a, a short uh, autobiography in a book, uh, uh, All the People. Um, I don't know if you can find that book anymore, but he talks about he was in the room when the ladies got together and they were there doing something else. They were sewing or quilting or doing something else uh, and, and socializing. And they started talking about black ash baskets and, you know, that they were concerned that the knowledge of making black ash baskets was going to die with them. And uh, he happened to come in to the room. He was our tribal chair at the time. And uh, so that means he's obligated to everybody for everything. Uh, and uh, so they said, why don't you get us a black ash tree so that we can make baskets? Why don't men do that anymore? Because that's generally uh, uh, a guy thing. Because mostly because of the weight of the trees, uh, it just ends up being that more commonly, the guys would go out into the swamp and lug these several hundred pound trees out. And so uh, he didn't have a good answer except, I guess I should, right? Or I'm gonna. And so he did. And so uh, he remembers the first tree that he went out. Uh, and uh, this was pre uh, Emerald Bash Boar. So black ash trees were not hard to find. Uh, in the, we have a lot of woods uh, where I grew up in Southwest Michigan. So he uh, 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 got those trees. So it was traditionally sort of, you know, uh, a male thing to harvest the trees, and uh, at you know at the request of a basket maker. But the women would turn it from, uh, you know, inventory to. To, to product, I guess. I'm not sure if I'm using the right terminology, but they would uh, turn it from tree into basket. Thank you. 
Uh, I wanted to get to Dr. Pakatat's second question before I move on to some others. And that was, are the baskets themselves gendered? The, um, that's a great question. Uh, I tend to uh, speak of the sometimes um, if a bat for for me, I most commonly uh, what I get from the baskets are uh, that they are women, that they're female. But gender is such a fluid thing in the native world anyway that um, you know that's really sort of a, a colonial imposition, this idea of male and female, uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, so I, I guess uh, I'd have to say that I, I might talk to them more commonly, be, you know, because the baskets came from my grandmother and came from other women, uh, but, but I, but I, I don't think that they, that, but that's not, uh, that's not how I think of them, I guess, is I think of them as my elders, not really are they female or male. I think of them as my elders. And you had mentioned that um, previously that you take care of them um, as if they're elders, keeping them cool, keeping them warm, keeping them comfortable. Is that, um, is that what your role as caretaker of the exhibit really involved? Or could you speak more to that, what your role of caretaker did involve? Sure. Uh, thank you. Great question. Uh, and yeah, I'm not the owner of the baskets. Um, and I try to make that clear in the exhibit is that I don't own them. Uh, they, uh, I don't have that right, you know, and, uh, and that's not my, um, my, that's just not how it is. I, I am a caretaker for them. I'm a custodian for them. I make sure, I make sure that they are taken care of well. And, um, so yeah, I, uh, I, uh, talk to them. I say good night to them. I say good morning to them. And if the, in the winter, if a room is cool, or cold, you know, I, I might cover them with a blanket. Um, I might make sure that uh, if I have a place with air conditioning, I try to keep the place cool during the hot months. And, uh, but I also uh, was very uh, particular about the exhibit that, uh, that they be treated with respect, that they uh, have tobacco with them, that they, um, the cases be opened on a regular basis so that there's no problem with them uh, with breathing uh, because they're living beings. And um, so um, it's, uh, it's an interaction. One uh, funny story, when I first saw the exhibit after it came, went up, they put it up and I, and I was there for the opening. It was very dark. It was very dark in that area. And there were lights above it. I said, why is it so dark? And uh, the person said from the Field Museum, and, and you know, no, no, um, no bad on them, no fault on them. But they said, well, museum standards call for only, you know, 40 watt bulbs or whatever, you know, watt, lightage, wattage, whatever, uh, on basketry. And uh, I said, but, um, the baskets want to be seen, uh, and uh, they don't want to. They don't want to sit in the dark, and uh, they you can't hardly see this exhibit. Uh, is uh, so the baskets have lived in, as I mentioned before, flea shops, closets, garages. You know, during their some of them during their lifetimes, uh, they can handle a little uh, extra light. Uh, you know, it's nothing, you know, the museum world, of course, wants to preserve everything for, for always, right? That's their, uh, that's their ethos. That's their vision statement, if you will. Um, these things have a natural life cycle, uh, like we all do. And so, uh, the idea that we will preserve these things forever, that's, that's, 
I don't know how that works. You know, I know that uh, uh, while they're here, they deserve a good life. And so, so we increased the lighting, doubled the lighting so you could see the basket and, uh, and they could be seen and uh, see each other. And so, yeah. I've got a great uh, follow-up question from Meg Kennedy about um, uh, museum standards, actually. She said, thank you, John, for a wonderful session. I was moved about your story about hand oils and basket handling. I don't steward a collection that includes baskets, but I see the utility of including language about respectful and culturally appropriate object handling and collections management policies. Has anyone written about this, or have you seen it done well um, somewhere that you could point her to? It has been written about, um, and uh, but I can't uh, point to a specific. Uh, to to be honest, um, my uh, readings a lot in like museum theory, museum practice, museum uh, world. Um, uh, since I've been here at Ohio State for the last 10 years, that's not been the focus of, you know, my readings or my writings. And so um, I'm sure that, it, uh, that that there have been articles. So uh, there were articles when I was going to grad school. I just can't remember them at this point. I'm an old man, so I can't remember. Sure, and sorry to put you on the, the spot to remember that. <laughs> um, but I do... Uh, as someone who came uh, to ISAS from working in more of a museum background, I really appreciate your discussion of, you know, the idea of um, this museum idea of preservation and perpetuity versus the, the life cycle of these, these you know, living beings. Um, and that we need to think about that and rethink this, this Western colonial um, mindset when it comes to objects and, and museums and, and how, and become caretakers, um, you know, rather than rather than curators in the very very strict sense that we often think about. Um, I've got. Oh, sorry. If you wanted to to elaborate. No, I I agree. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yes. Uh, I've got a great question uh, from Brooke Morgan at the Illinois State Museum. She asks, are the dyes used in basket making natural, uh, vegetal or mineral or commercial? If uh, natural, are there requirements or traditions for harvesting those materials before incorporating them as dyes? Great question. I uh, didn't address this in, the, uh, in my presentation and uh, should have. Um, Kind of forgot to. So, uh, of course, originally uh, they would have been used uh, using uh, roots, barks, leaves, medicines uh, to color the baskets uh, back in the old days. Um, uh, up until probably at some point in the, I'm not sure when Ritz, R I T Z, Ritz dies. I think it's R I T Z. Ritz. Huh? Just Ritz. Ritz. Oh, it's Ritz. Ritz. My partner just mentioned Ritz is the cracker. Ritz is the die. <laughs> Ritz die. Um, and uh, so they were really colorful. And they were, um, of course, we had been dispossessed of a lot of our lands anyway, and it was difficult to find the plants. But frankly, also, uh, it attracted the tourist eyes. They had these bright, uh, wonderful colors. Um, the baskets start off being uh, somewhat uh, pale tan, you know, they've got, uh, and they turn gold as naturally as a patina. Uh, so you can tell them age somewhat from, uh, from that gold. That's another reason they have it exposed to light is that uh, uh, like all of us, we get better as we grow old. And uh, so, uh, but the rich dyes were used um, and are still used. Uh, writ, I'm sorry, writ dye uh, is used. And as far as I know, uh, they still use writ dye or something similar to that to dye them. The interesting thing oftentimes is that uh, if the 
baskets had been left out in the sunlight, like out of a basket from the 1920s or so. Uh, on the outside, if they've been exposed to sunlight, that dye has all faded away. And uh, But if you open them up on the inside, you can still see what they were originally dyed. Uh, and uh, and uh, Native people, along with tourists, love bright, beautiful things. They have a lot of power, right? You know, not just an aesthetic, but they have a power. And uh, so we make them as beautiful and as powerful as possible. We've got a related follow-up question uh, from my ISAS colleague, Aline Betzenhauser. She asks, what other tools are used in making black, black ash baskets? Sure. Um, there is uh, a, uh, a short video at the uh, Field Museum exhibit that shows uh, <laughs> the process for making uh, uh, black ash baskets uh, that uh, I'm able to uh, incorporate uh, uh, from the ladies, from the original founders, from the basket co-op. Uh, the, uh, the process is essentially that... Um, the logs have to be, you know, the trees cut. The logs are then brought to a uh, secure place on solid ground, uh, and they're oftentimes put on uh, essentially um, um, what are those things called um, uh, that, you, that they stand on, um, uh, not pedestals, mm -hmm. dogs, mm -hmm. saw horses, yes. Yeah. They're put on sawhorses, and uh, and they have to be pounded. This is oftentimes a, a, a guy thing to do. Uh, not always, but uh, oftentimes guys pound the log. And as you pound it, it loosens the uh, bark uh, from the rest of the uh, tree. And then the bark is uh, uh, harvested away, uh, cut away uh, with, uh, with knives and uh, uh, axes sometimes, you know, depending on how thick the bark is. So then uh, it is uh, cut into uh, strips. And then that's when the uh, fine work begins because they use some really sharp knives to scrape the strips. Uh, one side of the strip will naturally be like satiny smooth, uh, the side that was closest to the interior of the tree. Will be satiny smooth, and the but the other side uh, will be rough, and it has to be scraped so that both sides are satiny smooth. And so that's after that. Then of course they're uh, they are uh, wet, wetted down. You know they have to be wet when they are weaved, and uh, it's uh, primarily done with with their hands. You know, the weaving itself is a uh, hand work. Excellent, thank you. And that actually took us to, it's about to turn uh, four o'clock right now, four o'clock central, five o'clock your time. Uh, so I guess we will let that be the last question. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today and, and talking to us. I feel like we all took home some really big lessons thinking about being better caretakers um, uh, in museum settings for the, these individuals and these beings that we have the honor to, to work with when we are in museums. Um, and some, some definitely some things to think about moving forward and then also Again, how being uh, better stewards to our environment has, has real life impacts for uh, indigenous communities today with uh, a reminder about the, the ash borers and how that affects your community. Uh, so we're deeply grateful for your time and your, your expertise in sharing with us today. Uh, so I wanna officially say on behalf of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey and the Office of the State Archaeologist, Thank you to Dr. John Lowe and thanks to everybody in the audience uh, for joining us this afternoon. I do want to let everybody know that this lecture has been recorded and it will be posted on the ISAS YouTube page for further viewing. I'm about to put the link to our playlist 
our YouTube playlist that has all of the other uh, speakers, um, their lectures recorded uh, from both years of the series, last spring 2021 and the spring 2022. Dr. John Lowe's uh, lecture will be up uh, within the next week or so, so keep an eye out for it there. Uh, otherwise, thank you everybody. Thank you again to Dr. John Lowe, and I hope everyone has a, a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Bama P. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you all.